so bear with me. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about the uh, gas-powered valves. Uh, they're a little bit different uh, than what Phil was talking about earlier. Uh, solenoid valves are pilot-operated. These are remote gas-powered operated, and they're on or off. There's no, unlike a the regulator, they're not modulating. They're simply on or off. Typically, we're going to see these, though. Um, typically, we're going to see these are in lower temperature systems, you know, minus 20 and below. Sometimes you'll see them a little bit higher, but... But usually the advantage with these types of valves, uh, unlike a solenoid or a pressure regulator, that requires pressure drop to keep that valve or that piston open. Gas powered are normally open valves, which is also something you want to be aware of, they're normally open valves. So when that happens, uh, there's no pressure drop required to keep that valve open because that's its normal position. It's spring lifted. Um, when you go to close it though, you energize a solenoid coil on a pilot valve and that hot gas pressure pushes the piston down and holds it closed during a normal defrost cycle. So I just want to kind of orientate you where you can expect to see these types of valves and generally speaking why they're a little bit different than what Phil had covered with you a little bit earlier. Uh, so probably the most common valve right now in the industry in this type is called an ACK2 or a CK2. Um, it's a gas powered valve. You see them, you know, inch and a quarter is probably the smallest size you'll see these types of valves. Just because uh, you know lower temperature systems typically require larger uh, capacities and uh, intercourse is pretty small. All things being said, you'll, you'll see them primarily on the suction uh, suction lines. Occasionally, occasionally you'll see them on flooded uh, flooded evaporators. You'll see a gas powered valve on both the liquid and the uh, return, so the liquid supply to a flooded evaporator back to the vessel. In order to defrost those vessels, you have to isolate both legs of the. Uh, both legs of the uh, evaporator. So uh, you'll see a, a ACK2 style valve there. Um, key things to be aware of, uh, they're uh, best installed, and this, this is a commentary Phil tried to describe, I think, earlier, is, uh, we'll get that question sometimes. What's the right, you know, sometimes you'll see valves laying on the side, sometimes you'll see them vertically. Most, most times in a horizontal run, you'll see a, a valve installed vertically. Oftentimes, we'll recommend that the valves, on, and in particular on a, a gas bar valve, suction stop valve, they're going to be laying on the side. Do you guys recall why that might be or understand why that might be? Strange. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, what you'll, you know, I'll do some of his. So, normally, the, the normal flow of a valve is inlet outlet and then sometimes you'll see it come out like this or sometimes it'll just simply come out. So what you're seeing with the effect is is you have a, a pipe here more or less equal to where the seat is. If you look you'll see that the seat is almost dead center to the center of a pipe just or as, or, or, as it's orientated. <coughs> so what you can have is you can have liquid build up until it gets to a point that's equal or above slightly above the seat in order to have flow. So what you'll have is you'll have liquid slugs coming through here. Now, if you rotate this, if you rotate this like that, now what happens is you can have two-phase flow going through that valve, and that's the advantage. You know, it doesn't dam liquid ahead of the valve because it's now it's laying on its side. That port, or the, what we call the, the port or the opening of the valve, is in parallel with the pipe, and so you can have two-phase flow through the valve as opposed to what we were showing before where it has to build up and then dam up and get out. So that's why you'll see oftentimes gas powered valves, um, gas powered valves will be laid on their side because of that reason. We're trying to facilitate the two phase flow. There's no right or wrong answer. But the, you know, the valve will work in either direction, doesn't matter to the valve. But from a system operation, there's some advantages that you may see by having the valve mounted horizontal or laying on their side. Uh, Manual open stems, same deal, uh, always in for uh, these valves. It's funny. Okay, so why do you need a manual opening stem on a normally open valve? Here, uh, someone might want to hear that. Or not, it's your choice. <laughs> we have some that are mainly uh, gas powered slugs, too, though. Yeah, well, these are gas powered. Yeah, it's I mean, a, it's gas powered open, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, and I'll, I'll touch base on that as well. There's um, 
There's a variation called S9As, which are gas powered valves that are normally closed valves and they uh, drive open with the gas power. Um, there's, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages. I mean, I can go to whatever level you guys want to go in today. There's nothing, there, what the advantage with the, well, I can jump to it. Um, let me see if I can we talk about it at all. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll say that we do talk about it. Ours is normally open, but I'm glad to, I'm glad to talk about that as well. So the, one of the advantages of the valve, besides just being normally open, it's very simple. It's a very simple valve. Uh, your low temperature, you're usually dealing with uh, cold temperatures, viscous oil, perhaps. Um, so you've got a lot of uh, high pressure gas to drive this valve into the closed position. Most times you're in normal refrigeration though, so the valve by default is in the most efficient position it should be in. A wide open, no pressure drop across the valve. No, anytime you're driving that piston close, you have a, a small amount of bleed around it, so you'll have this constant load. Anytime you're in defrost, besides the uh, gas uh, that's being relieved through the defrost relief regulator, you'll have some bypass around the piston on a gas power valve. The valve you were talking about earlier, because it's normally closed, it, um, the advantage with that is during defrost, sometimes you're sealed piston, sometimes you're not, but they'll stay closed for you uh, and not have that bleed, because typically they're sealed pistons. Uh, this advantage with them is you have to constantly feed uh, high gas pressure to them when they're open, which is more the majority of the time, I would imagine. Uh, these valves, not a problem with respect to being open all the time. Um, very dirt tolerant, super strong. Um, really, the only reason you have a manual opening stem on these is in case something happens to the stem or because of viscous oil, the valve gets jammed in a position. So you can drive that uh, piston back open. So this, this is, I think this is such a simple valve, I won't spend a lot of time talking through the, the, each step of the op its operation. Again, this is uh, the position when it's closed, gas, hot gas is coming into the top of the valve. Um, configuration you may see in the field is, uh, again, Phil was describing, hey, what can happen when you have 70 pounds of uh, pressure in your evaporator at the end of a defrost, and you go to open up one of these valves wide open, creates that slug down the uh, suction line, right? Hydraulic shock, it, it's called, and, and really some of the uh, ma some of the major events in our industry have been, have been tied to and around defrost sequencing and cycling and the effects of exactly what can happen if you suddenly release that pressure down the pipe. So uh, what we would, uh, what we would always suggest is have some mechanism for reducing that pressure before you open up the main valve. And it's, and it's, okay. So, um, so what we would suggest is, as you come to uh, a conclusion of your normal defrost cycle, instead of opening this main valve, we would suggest that you have uh, what we call an equalized stage, which would allow the pressure in the evaporator to bleed down to suction before you open up the main valve. And does anybody know the right amount of time how long, how long should it be bleed uh, an evaporator? It depends on the size of your line and the size of your evaporator. Yeah, yeah, that's the best answer I've heard ever. It depends, right? It really does. You don't know because evaporators are different size, conditions are different at any given time. Pressures, hot gas pressure is different. So it depends, right? So there's no magic answer. It's not five minutes, it's not 10 minutes, it's not one minute. It's until the pressure is equalized or nearly equalized, that's the right time to open up that main valve. But how do you know? I mean, how, how do you know what's the right amount of time? It's also good. Oh, I'll, I'll I want in there and find it. That's, that's one way, yeah, yeah, it's one way. It's actually one way. Uh, matter of fact, on a commissioning, that may be the best way. Hey, you know, watch watch a typical defrost cycle and dial it in and say, okay, I, I know with this one evaporator, this size of evaporator in this room, this condition, it's about five minutes, okay. Minimum five minutes. I, I would say that's the, that becomes your minimum, right? Minimum five minutes. Uh, I'll jump back to this in a second. Um, what happens? What happens? Uh, what happens if you're in defrost and you lose power? What happens? Sometimes people get killed. Sometimes people get hurt. Yeah. yeah. That equalized stage that we talked about earlier is not in play, right? Lost power. What's going to happen in that main valve? 
it's gonna open, right? It normally open valve, right? It's, it's gonna open. So, uh, you know, we came up with a couple innovations around it, safety innovations. And the first is, um, is this, uh, we call it ACK5. And the designation, what it does is, you know, we talked about that 70 pounds of pressure that's built up in the evaporator during defrost. So we actually use, we actually use that pressure to, to help keep that main valve closed. So that you got 70 pounds of reserve energy there that's available to keep that main piston closed. So this uh, ACK5 valve actually uh, utilizes, utilizes that high pressure source that's in the evaporator to keep this, uh, I'm sorry, it's coming through here. This is your high, high pressure gas source through the solenoid valve and it comes down to the main piston. But an ancillary piping, I don't know if I showed it's in this presentation. Oh, yeah, here it is, here it is. Um, so uh, what's really interesting about this valve is it provides that loss of power protection that you might need under those circumstances. So here, here what we're doing is we've got the evaporator and defrost, <coughs> it's approximately 70 pounds. There's your equalizer we just described. You still need an equalized valve because you still, under normal circumstances, you want that pressure to bleed down. But here's, here's the cheapest insurance you'll ever buy is you have this auxiliary pilot pressure valve that captures some of the 70 pounds to keep this piston closed when you lose power here. That's, that's the, the theory, right? Not the theory, but that's the practice. So what it does is it protects, it always protects <coughs> from loss of power. It doesn't, oops, sorry. Um, so, so that's the concept. So this valve, ACK5, what this does is it provides you loss of power protection. It still requires an external to equalize because under normal circumstances, you still want to bleed that evaporator down. I talk fast. I don't know if I'm talking too fast or not, but well, you're good. You know, I'm all right? Thanks. Uh, so there's, a, there's another uh, innovation that we developed uh, a number of years ago, and it's called the ACK5D. And D for us, uh, stands for dual or dual position valve. It's kind of like the HS4Ds that Phil talked about earlier. It's a two-step valve. So within this one valve, there's actually two different stages for the valve. So um, I'll walk you through it. It's probably easier to see the drawings and to read text, so I'll do that. Um, okay, so same basic concept as an HCK2, simple piston, but now in this case, you actually have two pistons. One, you have an upper and a lower piston. So here we're showing uh, this is a high pressure gas source coming into the top of the valve. Uh, this is shown in the closed position already. So this is, you can see there's actually, there's a upper piston and a lower piston. And this is now energized, so this is in the closed, the main seat is down here. So this is in the main, uh, this is in the fully closed position. This is a, a opening spring that's fully compressed. So during the defrost cycle, you've got your seven pounds defrost, high gas coming into your evaporator, you've got that independent reseating relief regulator that Phil talked about, you know, that uh, will relieve, and once you get to 70 pounds, it'll start to open up. Uh, so all that's going on in the background. So uh, when you're going to, when you begin to terminate, you terminate your hot gas supply now, you're coming out of defrost, you stop the hot gas, uh, the fans are not running yet, right? And you want to let, uh, the pressure, that 70 pounds of pressure that's in the evaporator, you want that to bleed down. So um, this is a unique design in that, that upper piston, once you terminate this hot gas supply, then the pressure that was above this piston bleeds off and it reveals this internal porting on the main piston. So now this is what we call an internal bleed. So instead of having a separate bypass valve, that bleed valve is in essence captured inside this piston. So you have, this, oops, sorry. So, you, now it's over two. All right, now we're back to it. All right, here we go. Sorry. Uh, so, here you've got that equalized valve performing the function uh, through these internal passages. And um, the key here, though, is because of the geometry of the pit, the, this, this main piston the differential that's required, the inlet pressure is still holding this main piston down. 
because of the geometry, it's slightly larger than an opening down below. So it's holding that piston down. And what we're waiting to have happen is when the pressure on the inlet to the outlet begin to equalize, this is what happens. That spring, that opening spring, is, overcomes that uh, pressure on top of the piston and it goes open. So the real key to this is it's not based on time. It's based on pressure differential across the valve. So when we were talking before about hey, what's the right amount of time, it, it's, it's, it comes down to pressure. Right? It's the right amount of pressure differential. Could be five minutes, could be 10 minutes. What this valve does is it, it, it because the geometry of the piston, it says, hey, I'm waiting for about 10 pounds differential. When you have about 10 pounds differential, that opening spring is strong enough to overcome the upper force on top of the piston. And then that's what allows this valve to open. So it does really two, it really does two things very, very effectively, very safely. It uh, allows that piston or allows that evaporator to lead down before you go into normal refrigeration mode. And it also provides you loss of power protection in one, right? So even, even under a interrupted, uh, unexpected loss of power, what happens to this valve if it's already in the defrost? It goes in, it goes into bleed mode, bleed mode, which is not a bad place to be, honestly, guys. It's and that'll keep it, that's to save you from that sludging. Of It'll save you from the sludge, yeah, it'll absolutely save you so from the sludge. So it's almost an automated safety feature. <coughs> yeah, and, and the, other, the other advantage, I think, and I'm a big proponent of this style, uh, is because uh, even if you have an equalized valve around, what happens if you burn out a coil? Do you still have that equalized feature or not? No. And you don't. You can still wait five or 10 minutes, it doesn't matter. Nothing. Nothing's happening. With this valve, because the, the design of it, it doesn't allow that valve to open until that differential is there, right? Um, what's, uh, <laughs> so the other thing you need to be aware of though, and this goes back to our about time, right? So how long does it take for this to bleed down? Well, it's, it's variable, right? It depends on how much pressure and the other factors. So what you don't want to do, if you have this style valve, uh, what you don't want to do is bring the liquid back online before that piston has an opportunity to open. Otherwise, what happens? The pressure remains and that differential remains, so that main piston seam will never come up. And so that's, you just want to be wary because you know uh, when we first came out with these, we, 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 we had that on occasion, right? Uh, you guys said, hey, the valve's stuck. And in essence, it really wasn't stuck, it was doing its job. It was, that main piston was staying down because the pressure was too great. But he had already brought liquid back online and pressure was building inside the evaporator. So it never, it never went to the full open position. It was always in this bleed mode. Uh, nice thing about the HCK5D is it's, uh, it's a drop-in replacement for the HCK2s. So you have HCK2s or even another brands that has that same flange pattern you can drop in, replace an ACK2 with an ACK5D, and it still only requires the one pilot solenoid valve. You know, there's not, unlike the ACK5, where you have that auxiliary piping that you'd have to fit. With this, there's no additional piping required because this is dropped in, this is just one solenoid valve that activates a high pressure source on top of the ACK5D. So it's a great, I, I think it's a great conversion um, to consider in your plants. I, I just think it's a safer valve and um, it provides you a lot of safety and uh, protection. So uh, HS9B, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like that normal close. There's a, there's a difference, RS, if you guys are familiar with the part of RS <coughs> valves, they have an S9A, which is a normally closed position valve. Uh, Dan Foss may have one as well. Uh, uh, Hansen's is HS9B. The B designation is like like the B feature on a, a regulator. It's a wide open feature. So this valve is normally open. It, it, it's only a consideration to be aware of. You design whatever your designer's prerogative is. Normally open, normally closed. I'm a, I'm more of a proponent or more of a fan of normally open because it's to me it's a safer position to have the valve in on the suction line, not on a liquid line. I always want a normally closed valve on a liquid line or high gas line. A suction line. You know, unless it's on a chiller or something like that, where you're really worried about, you know, freeze protection, normally open on a low temperature, not on a you know, intermediate temperature, but on a low temperature, I think that's the way to go. Uh, 